minus five, four, three, two, one. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery. about 13 or 14. It was the second thing everybody learned about me after my name. Hi, my name is Pam Melroy and I want to be an astronaut. Houston flight is go. My job as a commander is to make sure that the crew has everything that they need to do the technical part of the mission. Yes, I have my technical part and I won't play that down, docking to the space station, landing the shuttle, those are very important technical skills that I have to have. My job is actually to make sure that everybody on the crew has the training, that they are mentally prepared, that they are physically in good shape. You know, I'm sort of mom and dad all rolled into one. For a space shuttle mission, typically we start training a year out. The nine to ten month point is when things really start to ramp up and it's totally crazy inside the last four months. You're just absolutely trying to juggle everything that's going on and it doesn't help that half the people you know in the universe want to come to see you launch and so you have to throw a party for them even though you're in quarantine and you can't go. So imagine trying to plan a party that you're not actually going to attend. <laughs>
Mr. Pam, while we're waiting, uh, when you see Stephanie, you can let her know that the Red Sox won the World, World Series. Woo! Well, I take it, it met your approval. Appreciate it. That's great news. Go Sox! Woo! You're welcome. I don't think I've ever felt so connected to the earth and to people as I was when I was 250 miles away. I think at night especially, um, nature goes away at night. You don't see the forces of nature, which is what you see over the daytime. The only thing you see are human beings. You see the lights where people live. To me, that was really amazing, was to make this connection. Everywhere there was a light, someone had turned on a light switch or created light. They'd used technology to change their lives and make it better. And here I am floating around in the highest pinnacle of what I think human technology is all about. And to me, that was a profound sense of connection. Houston Discovery on the big loop for both control teams. We just wanted to say a very good night to you. Happy Halloween. We're not sure if today was a trick or a treat or both, uh, but we sure enjoy working with you every single day of the year. Happy Halloween. And Houston copies all. Happy Halloween. You know, there are a lot of things in life that are pretty darn scary. Um, taking a test. You're scared every single time. It doesn't matter. I don't care who you are. You sit down and there's a, a paper and pencil and you have to start the test. There's a little heart pounding going on and, you know, some mental process and a little bit of adrenaline. So that's scary too. And a lot of things that are worth doing are scary. You have to take a chance to do something that you really believe in. I'm not big into taking unnecessary chances. I don't do, I'm not a thrill seeker. I don't go bungee jumping. I don't try to go do crazy things just because I want an adrenaline rush. I feel like taking a risk is all about taking a chance to achieve something, to go beyond yourself and go beyond what it means to be an individual, become a part of a team, become a part of the human race and achieve something tremendous. So it's worth the risk. Well, I hate to say it, but yes, being an astronaut is totally cool. It's the coolest job in or out of the world. What can I say? It's hard, it's fun, it's exciting. You see things, feel things, and do things that you could never even imagine. Test pilots essentially are trained to be engineers and scientists with airplanes. We do experiments with airplanes. And so that's what sets us up to be astronauts. It takes two pilots to fly the shuttle. Um, the one who is controlling the stick is the commander. The pilot operates all the systems and makes the calls and the backup and it's like co-pilot and captain. And we just find that our best crew members are the ones who've had a lot of education, have been exposed to a lot of different types of science and math and have learned how to do research for themselves. And they're the ones who are best able to absorb the information efficiently and quickly. So we find essentially the more education you have, the better a crew member you are overall. The great thing about being an astronaut is every day is a little bit different. We have scuba training so that we can actually dive down in the pool and watch our space walkers who are floating in the neutral buoyancy laboratory, which is a, the world's largest indoor swimming pool, probably the world's largest pool period, where we actually have a mock-up of the space station. What we can do is we can make our spacewalkers neutrally buoyant. If you've ever been scuba diving, you know what that means is you're not going to float all the way to the surface, but you won't sink to the bottom. You'll float right in the middle, and we do that with a combination of air inside the suits and weights. And so it's as close as we can get to practicing a zero gravity spacewalk. So they'll float around in their suits underwater with their tools, 
in a huge mock-up and they'll practice all the maintenance tasks that they'll be doing on the station. As we get closer to the mission, we'll really start to drill down in on exactly what we're going to do and then we're going to dress rehearse it over and over and over again. We strap into the motion-based sim. It's a little mini shuttle cockpit uh, encapsulated and it's set on hydraulic stilts. We can actually tilt the whole thing 90 degrees back so you're lying on your back just like you will be on the launch pad. And you can practice an ascent lying on your back. How it feels to reach the switches, how, to, how it feels to reach the controls. Good, good switch. I'll be flying the STA, which is the shuttle training aircraft. It's a Gulfstream that's been modified to fly like the shuttle. Inside, half the cockpit looks just like the shuttle. The other half looks like a Gulfstream jet. And we'll climb all the way up to about 35,000 feet, at which point the instructor, who's sitting in the right seat, throws a switch and converts the flight control system from a Gulfstream flight control system to one that mimics the space shuttle. And at that moment, when he throws that switch, then I'm in control and I'm flying it just like flying the shuttle. Whip six, which is uh, one uh, radial hand roll over to your left. It's outboard of the radiator. Outboard of the radiator. Yeah, yeah. It's all the way at the tip of that. There it is. There it is. Okay. Yeah. The training is very centered around surprising you. In fact, there's a lot of very evil people who basically sit around thinking up sort of worst case scenarios. So what we have to do is try to stay one step ahead of them and think about what we're going to do in those situations. But most of the time it just kind of comes as a shock. And you figure if it comes as a shock in training, at least it won't come in as a shock if it really happens to you on orbit. There's a visual and a sensory overload, I think, that's very difficult to explain. On ascent, the tremendous amount of noise and vibration, uh, the sensation of clouds going by, or the earth going by, looking out the window and seeing the Terminator, where it goes from day to night on the earth, watching a sunset from space as you are climbing through the sky at speeds that are absolutely incredible. We don't fly manually. The power of a rocket is a very different thing than an airplane. You are much more along for the ride. The commander's job on ascent is actually to make sure that you're still pointed in the right direction. I kind of like to jokingly refer to it as keeping the pointy end going forward. Throttling. Hey. Three at 100. Woo-hoo! 102 and auto. Three at 104. There's eight seconds. Roll command. Roll program, Houston. I see it. Discovery. Some ascents are very violent and some are less so, but you can probably have heard a commander's voice occasionally sounding like they're quavering in, you know, in fear or whatever. And the reality is they're just getting knocked around so hard that that's, that's what you're hearing. But the, the first few calls are really all about making contact between mission control and the shuttle. It's a warm fuzzy to make us all know that we're talking to each other. And so, uh, for example, I'll call roll program. Well, of course there's a roll program. Anybody who is looking out the window or at a camera can see that the shuttle is rolling. What we're doing is we lift clear of the pad. We're rolling to get into the correct inclination to go to catch the space station. But it's to, to make sure that we've got positive voice contact between the Earth and my vehicle. So I will call Houston Atlantis roll program. Roger roll. Everybody's happy. Then they're going to call go at throttle up. Discovery Houston, go at throttle up. Go and up. The purpose of that call is just 
another warm fuzzy. Yep, we're here. I, I can see the throttles going up. You can see the throttles going up. Everybody knows that the throttles are powering up and it's being controlled by the computers. So if the computers are running right and the engines are running right, it's all going to happen naturally. For all the fact that we're not actually physically flying, your level of attention is extremely high. Maybe I can best compare it to if you were driving on a rainy or a snowy night and you were not the driver, you're the navigator, you've got the map out and you're looking for the right exit. And so you're keeping track and you're looking and you're saying, okay, it looks to me like we've got three exits to go. Okay, we've got two exits to go. Okay, we've got one exit to go. And you're not actually physically driving, but you're very engaged and you're very focused and you're really paying attention to what's happening inside and outside the car. And that's probably a closer analogy to what, it's, to what the pilots are actually doing. Alpha Discovery, initiating RPM, three, two, one, mark. Alpha copies on two. Discovery's Commander Pam Milroy is maneuvering the vehicle through a nine minute, 360 degree backflip that uh, call from Discovery's pilot, George Zamka, on the start of the RPM, the rendezvous pitch maneuver. We do have to do uh, an orbital maneuvering system. Our Ohm's engines burn very shortly, about 35 minutes or so after we get into space. And the reason why is essentially we launched into an orbit that will take us right back where we started. That's pretty normal, which means we're gonna hit the Earth if we don't do something about it. So what we do is once we, we get to the altitude we wanna be at or pretty close, we fire our engines to circularize our orbit and make sure that we're gonna stay in orbit the whole time. So I will actually fly the shuttle. I'll do a little backflip. We're in free fall the entire time and the Earth is curving away from underneath us. We keep falling towards the Earth, but it curves away faster than we can hit. So we just keep going. Yeah, cool, isn't it? <laughs> when you go on ascent, the g-forces are straight through your chest. You're lying in a chair on your back looking straight up at the sky. So the sense of acceleration is all through the, your chest. It feels like there is a large elephant sitting on your chest. Or, you know, your cat has gotten 400 pounds bigger and is trying to wake you up in the morning. It's hard to breathe you go from three G's to zero G's. So you have this tremendous force pressing down on your chest and then suddenly you're floating. And your stomach kind of says to you, what was that all about? <laughs> it's kind of, uh, yeah, that's, that's really wild. You can actually f sort of feel your organs shift a little bit in your body. Uh, it definitely feels very different. Uh, that big transition from three G's through the, through the uh, chest and then zero, that's quite a dramatic moment. But it's also fun. At that moment, the engines have stopped. Your troubles are over because you don't have to worry about anything bad happening. You're in space now. Apollo found some macadamia nuts and uh, decided to test orbital mechanics and uh, also uh, at the same time test his uh, skill and coordination. Uh, it seemed like there was uh, not too many macadamia nuts he could eat at one time. You could see he was uh, celebrating his victory. Zero G is like fantastic. It's so much fun. You're, and everybody's graceful. You look like a ballerina. I mean, it's just really fun to maneuver in zero G. You can do what look like these heroic feats of activity just using a single finger as you flip yourself around and maneuver yourself. This is Mission Control Houston with the view of the Space Shuttle Discovery. Backdropped my views of the Andes uh, mountain range in South America as Discovery and the International Space Station pass about 215 statute miles above the continent. The Harmony Connecting Node is visible in Discovery's cargo bay. Payload is our cargo. It's, uh, it's our mission. It's the purpose for us going to space. So we, we never just go on a joyride. You've always got business when you go up. 
This is Mission Control Houston. This is a live view from the International Space Station, just making its way over the western coast of the United States, where you can clearly see those uh, wildfires which have been burning in, in multiple areas of Southern California. One of the most important things we do is to take pictures of the Earth. I call it our hidden payload because we don't always talk about it, but we get trained in how to take pictures of all kinds of things, geological features, ocean features. How could you see that anywhere except from space? I set a little timer on orbit and I said, okay, it's time to go take a picture of that lake that somebody really wants a picture of in South America. So I'll get the camera set up about two or three minutes prior and I'll be looking out the window and I, you see the lake come into view and you take a picture of it. And if we're lucky, it was in focus and it was the, the feature that the uh, scientists wanted to see. So a lot of times we're the first people to take aerial pictures uh, in remote locations, especially of volcanoes or mudslides or a lot of times big hurricanes, big weather systems. The picture of the Earth that was taken on Apollo 17, where you see Africa and the clouds and everything, it's sort of the classic picture. They say that one picture has had the most effect on the environmental movement that has started from the 60s to now. Houston Discovery with a weather report for Florida. We could see the runway from orbit, so we're thinking the weather there is looking pretty good. We always know when we're over the United States, especially during the day, because everybody feels a sense of wanting to look at it. And of course, we all know each other's hometowns, so we always kind of keep our eye out for that. I do remember one time looking out and seeing the Finger Lakes, which are such a distinctive feature, and knowing right where we were, and just dropping everything and saying, get the cameras, we're over Rochester. It looks like a work of modern art hanging out there, like a star, a really bright star sparkling. And then you get closer and closer to it. And it is amazing looking. The solar rays have this beautiful bronzy gold color. And the station is sort of black and white and silver and gold. And it's just magical looking. The Space Shuttle Discovery now 30 feet away from the International Space Station. Docking is still a little bit tricky because you're flying two 250,000 pound vehicles and trying to mate them up together. The good news is those, those thrusters in this microgravity environment that we're in are very precise and you can actually move yourself very, very small amounts, like an inch or a couple of inches, but you, you have to kind of be able to anticipate. We actually have to dock within about an inch and a degree, so we're, we try to be very precise. This is Mission Control Houston, docking confirmed of the Space Shuttle Discovery to the International Space Station at 7.40 a.m. Central Time. Discovery arriving. Now the space station doesn't land, so it's out there. It's like a ship out in the ocean with no way to come into port. But the space shuttle is just like an enormous space truck. We carry all kinds of cargo, but we also carry extra air, oxygen and nitrogen, just like we breathe here on the Earth. There's actually a series of plumbing all the way through the space station so that we can hook hoses up and pump oxygen and nitrogen out of the shuttle systems into the station systems and resupply them. Every time you do a spacewalk, you let air out of the airlock and it's gone forever and you have to recharge it from the tanks. So it's important that we are good house guests and uh, instead of eating up all the, the groceries, and in this case all the breathing all their air and letting it out on the EVAs, we're going to recharge their systems so that we have been good neighbors and good friends and we have left them with just as much air as they had when we arrived.
National Space Station is a huge laboratory in the sky. It's all about doing science in space. Remember your labs when you were a kid in school? You change one parameter at a time. You change one thing and you see what happens that's different. Well, in microgravity, everything is different. The way our bodies behave is different. The way flames burn is different. Now, we have a laboratory that we can do science 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. Each time we go up, we bring a new piece of the space station. So just like building any big house, you have different elements to it. You might have, you might have the kitchen first, you might have the bedrooms first, then you build the living room, then you might build a workroom, then you might add the garage, and so that's what we're doing. The shuttle robotic arm is being operated by Discovery's astronauts Stephanie Wilson and George Zamka. Once we get this element out there, and for us it's node two, we have to attach it. The space station arm can actually reach node two and they will install it on the space station. So that's our big delivery task. But wait, there's more. <laughs> in our case, we're actually relocating a solar array. Now we need solar arrays in space to provide power because the space station is a laboratory. If you've ever been inside a laboratory, you know there's plugs and outlets everywhere in, in those laboratories. You've got to keep your computers running, you've got to keep your experiments running, you have to keep air conditioning running. We have to keep the people inside the station alive. So the solar arrays collect rays from the sun, light from the sun, and convert it to electricity and store it in batteries. Houston Alpha on the big loop, we are preparing for the solar array deploy. Houston copies, we are ready for it, Pambo. Solar array deploy starting on my mark. Three, two, one, mark. The ground specialist here confirming the uh, deploy going well. All indications are it's going as planned. Houston Alpha on the big loop, um, we uh, detected some uh, what appears to be a wraparound or some damage and we're zoomed in on it on camera 24 right now. And of course we aborted.
Well, now we're ready to expand. We have the U.S. laboratory up there, but we're ready to have more people and do more science. So Node 2 is actually really important because Node 2 is like the hub of a Tinker Toy set. We'll be able to attach the European and the Japanese laboratories. So it's sort of the gateway to our international partners doing science on the station. It also has some life support equipment so that we can sustain life for more than just three crew members. So that's another really huge thing. Our spacewalkers will go out and actually make all those connections. They'll hook up the hoses, they'll power on equipment, and they'll get that node ready to function. And then, of course, we're delivering Dan Tani to the space station. So that's exciting, too. I feel like he's part of my payload. <laughs> I'm making sure I'm delivering a scientist to the space station and bringing another one home. I guess this is the time when Discovery officially welcomes Clay with open arms to our crew. We can't wait to bring you home to your family. And it's also our time to say farewell to Dan. So we're going to miss you terribly. Uh, we promise uh, that we will send somebody to come pick you up and bring you home. And to Peggy, thank you. It's just been an honor and a privilege to uh, share uh, the command of this mission with you uh, throughout the doc time frame. And uh, our personal relationship has just made it all that much better. And Yuri, thank you so much for all the help that you gave to us as well. We simply could not have accomplished the mission without everybody's help. And so the, the two crews... The two crews have worked together so well that this is uh, one that we will always remember. We're family now. This view from the International Space Station watching the Space Shuttle Discovery fly around. Discovery more than 600 feet away from the International Space Station after having undocked an hour and nine minutes ago. Yep, we'll see you on the ground. Discovery's descent rate is 20 times higher and 7 times steeper than a commercial airliner on the final approach. It feels as though there is someone sitting on your head and shoulders. You have this sensation of slowly sliding down in your seat because you feel this sense of gravity returning or coming back down and feeling like somebody put the world on fast forward. Because you're going Mach 25 at 50 miles above the surface of the Earth. And it is just absolutely clear you are screaming. You can't help thinking at some point, am I going to make the runway? Am I just going to go hurtling right past it? You're sort of tired coming into gravity after being in zero gravity. Your body kind of takes a vacation. It's really comfortable. It's easy for your heart to pump the blood around your body. It's easy to move your muscles. It's very, very easy to do everything. And then gravity comes back, and it starts to come back through the entry. And every time you make a, an S-turn as you're approaching the runway, you just, oh, you know, you feel crunched down in the seat, and you feel really heavy. So all this stuff is going on while you're trying to fly at the same time. Most important landing of your life, but never mind. Don't worry about that. All this is going on.
Discovery's landing gear is down and locked in place. Main gear touchdown. Commander Penn Melroy is rotating the nose gear down to the runway and nose gear touchdown. Discovery is rolling out on runway 33 at the Kennedy Space Center, wrapping up a 6.25 million mile mission. Discovery completing its 34th mission to space and the 23rd shuttle flight to the International Space Station. We'll stop Discovery. Congratulations on a tremendous mission and a great landing, Pam. Stop y'all.